empowering, enlightening, and intelligent. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Luminous Cafe. Let's talk about it. Hello, hello, hello. You know what time it is. Here we are again at the LaRulis Cafe. Again, we have a terrific, terrific program for you. Uh, we have some, tonight kicks off a new segment that we have with the LaRulis Cafe. It's called Real Talk. And the real talk for tonight is that we're going to talk about America's two pandemics. And yep, you can guess what they are. You've heard about it a lot in the last few days. One, of course, is the COVID-19. Everybody knows about that pandemic. And the one that we all lived all of these years, and a lot of people didn't want to face it, but a lot of folks throughout the world are recognizing it now, and that is racism. We have some amazing lawmakers who are going to come on tonight and talk about the two pandemics, the pandemic of COVID-19 and how it is impacting people who look like us throughout, not just the state, but throughout the country. And we're also going to talk about all of the new situations that are occurring as it relates to unemployment, housing, healthcare disparities. As you know, this year, uh, well, today, we see that there has been an upgrade of the charges on the officer who killed Mr. Floyd in Minnesota. We see that the other three officers have been charged as well. Uh, unfortunately, here in our own city of Trenton, the capital city of the state, uh, last night we had our 15th homicide, 15th homicide. And then this morning, we had three people, a triple shooting in the city of Trenton in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of all of the emotional protesting and awaiting a new decision, new charges on the uh, George Floyd case. We now in our own city, uh, the capital city of, of, of Trenton, of, of New Jersey, we are talking about 15 homicides, and we're just in the sixth month. So we're gonna bring on our legislators one by one. They are simply amazing women. Uh, we're going to start with Trenton's own Assemblywoman, Verlina Reynolds Jackson. Bring her on, please. How are you doing, Assemblywoman? Good evening, I'm fine, how are you? Oh my goodness, you're a sight for sore eyes. I say this all the time. And in fact, all of you are, all of you are just amazing women. Um, I thank you for coming on LaRulis Cafe. And um, we're going to have some amazing conversations with you this evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And, and thank you for the invitation to be able to share some of the things that we're doing at the legislature from the state's point of view. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, the next person we're going to bring on, uh, this young lady served on the Essex County Freeholder Board. She even had the nerve when she got on, she became the president of the Essex County Freeholder Board. I said, when I read the article and I read her age, I said, there is no way in the world this young lady is the president of the Freeholder Board. And when I met her, I can imagine it was not a tough decision at all for her colleagues to elect her, not once but twice, to be their president. And now she is in the assembly, the New Jersey assembly. And guess what, before I bring her on, you need to know she's gotta be powerful because she succeeded the Lieutenant Governor. This is the office that the Lieutenant Governor held and it didn't even matter about big shoes to, to fill, she had her own feet and she has filled those shoes. Bring her on, Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake. 
thank you so much, Janine. It really is an honor to be here with you um, and to also be here with my other sisters in the assembly. We're all doing such great work collectively and um, it's really appreciated and needed, especially during these perilous times that we're living in. And uh, the COVID-19 is new as a pandemic to America, but unfortunately racism is old and it really is the Achilles heel of the United States of America. So I look forward to talking more about uh, both pandemics uh, during today's broadcast. Beautiful, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And the next person I met her uh, during the time that we were talking about hairstyles. Um, as you can see, I have a natural hairstyle and I've worn my hair naturally now. My daughter is 48. And I don't think she ever remembers seeing my hair, not naturally. It's been at least 47 years. And uh, this woman signed on as one of the prime sponsors of the bill that said you will no longer discriminate against people with ethnic hairstyles. And that's when I got to know her up close, none other than Angela McKnight. And she's doing a lot of other things uh, in the community. We'll talk about that a little later, but Angela, thank you for coming on here today. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Both pandemics are terrible and my colleagues and I will continue to do all that we can to make sure that New Jersey is number one and leading the charge to making things right. So thanks again for having me on tonight. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. It is our honor. And last and certainly not least, now I did see her. And yeah. Um, yeah, I saw her on here, good. Shanique Spate, this is another one who talks about her dream job. She is in the, uh, you're a sheriff, aren't you? You're working yes, for the sheriff's office? Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on, Shanique. Um, it, it's been a real honor getting to know you. You are so, well, all of you are interactive with me on Facebook, but I always love it when you come over after this show, you always say, thank you for this show, or it was a great, great, great issue that you did tonight. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you so much, Janine, just for having us on tonight. I apologize for my tardiness. I had technical difficulties, but I, I it's just a pleasure to be here to just have this conversation. As we know, racism has been a pre-existing pandemic um, that we have had for such a long time and COVID-19 just have made it worse for people in our community. So I look forward to having this conversation on tonight. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And before I lose you on that screen, let me just say this to you. On LaRue's Cafe, you're never late. When you get here, you're always on time. So you're right not, now. Look, look, Shanique, you know how we do. You know how okay. we do. This is, this is a conversation. I always say to people when they come on the LaRue's, I don't do interviews. I don't do interviews. We have conversations and it is equal. So we are equal partners here. And you know, I want to talk about this thing as far as equal partners, because I noticed when we had, um, as you know, I've served several years on the legislative um, Black Caucus Board of Directors for the foundation. And we had the reception welcoming all of the uh, new black legislators a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to the, uh, um, the president emeritus, Senator Ronald Rice, I remember saying to him, Ron, we finally got it right. All these awesome women got elected, all these women. I couldn't believe how many new females we brought into the legislature that year. Tell me about how you got here. And I want to talk with um, Assemblywoman Reynolds Jackson first. Give us a snapshot version of your journey. So so I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see this. This is um, a fam family photo. Yep, right there. And so that's me, my brother, my mom, and my nephews. And there, there are a few of them that are missing. And so the, the unique thing is that they're all boys. I have nine nephews and I am that super auntie. I, I just did everything and anything I could for them and still try to do, although they're adults now, so I'm trying to cut the cord. But you know, it came a time in our family that, that my brother needed some help. Um, I stepped in to say, let me help you all out. 
And I instantly got a reality check on being a single parent with four children. My car broke and two of my nephews um, were in middle school and one of them was having a hard time getting home from school. He was being bullied. And so long story short, I found myself calling different people. I called the principal, I call, I got to city hall, I got to the superintendent and you know, I, I met my representative and it just wasn't a great experience. And you know, at the time I was, I think I was in my early mid third twenties. And it, you know, I felt like I was educated. I was a college grad, I was a social worker. I was the resource person. And if I'm having all of these difficulties or I have to make all of these phone calls to try to get some relief, you know, from my nephew, I couldn't imagine the person that didn't know who to call or who to write to and all of the barriers that were there. And so I just got to the point where I was just fed up and sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I said, you know what? We need new representation. And it's not about winning or losing. It's about making sure people have access to the resources that they're supposed to. So I decided to run for local council. Um, you know, I thank the Lord I won. Um, I served there for two successful terms. Um, in between there- And you did a good job because I live in Trenton. So let me just say that on the record. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you so much. And you know, you meet people along the way. And I remember meeting um, Miss Snell who told me about something that was going on in her area. And she said, if I was your mom, you would have resolved this a long time ago. Mm. So long story short, her 20 year problem, we got fixed in like a week. And okay. it was just like a, such a relief. It wasn't even really something difficult, but again, it's about having access to the resources. So that's just a simple sample, but I wanted to continue. I wanted to grow. You know, I, I became a finance officer. I'm a certified municipal finance officer while I was on council to understand local government, how the budget is done. And so I began to have a new passion about following the money. And I used to, I still say, you know, you got to follow the money in order to get the resources. And so, you know, long story short, I was the chair of the Mercer County Democrats. Um, and then from there, I was successful when our treasurer, Liz Moyer, was in the assembly. Right, she went to right. the treasurer. And so here I am in this in the assembly. And so, you know, I look forward to um, continuing the work and following the money to to get us the resources that we need. At the end of the day, um, my my pitch is Trenton is the capital of New Jersey. We're not asking you for anything that's not due to us. We should be giving it to us. And so, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, um, we shouldn't be in the, the crisis that we're in. But we're mm -hmm. here and I'm going to continue to fight because I'm not tired yet. Well, let me tell you, and we're glad that you are sitting in the seat that you're sitting in right now. Thank you so much for that. You're uh, Brittany, let's talk about your journey um, because it's been a really fascinating ride for you. And I would imagine sometimes you and your husband probably look at each other and say, boy, oh boy, this is a roller coaster. How'd you get here? <laughs> you know, uh, Janine, politics is always a roller coaster, right? right. Um, but I got here, I, I, first of all, I'm a believer in, in the Lord, you know, and That's I respect right. everyone's faith and I don't try to push my faith on everybody, um, but I do proclaim mine boldly. And I believe that God has a will for everybody's life. And I'm very grateful to be sitting in the seat that I'm in and that people have entrusted me to represent them. Um, I have been a advocate, grassroots advocate for many years. I started off as um, in, in the area of housing, helping out with transitional homes with, uh, for young women, uh, transitioning out of the foster system and I moved on to actually beginning a permanent affordable home ownership housing organization to help people who are low to moderate income people become homeowners. We've helped people who were been janitors, even janitors their entire life to actually own homes in suburban areas and be able to afford it. And then also uh, make sure that people have an opportunity to be a landlord too, which uh, moves people out of being low to moderate income and giving uh, giving that population an opportunity to actually uh, knock on the door and enter the middle class. So um, economic justice has been a part of who I am for a very long time, as has housing justice. 
And um, I am very grateful to mentors over the years, uh, Assemblyman Thomas P. Giblin, who happens to now be my my running mate, my district mate. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to bring me into different political rooms just so that I could talk to different people about uh, important advocacy issues. And I was able to meet uh, another great mentor, some uh, uh, former assemblyman and also former freeholder, now Essex County Democratic Chairman and East Orange Democratic Chairman, Leroy Jones, um, who approached and asked me to run for office. And after a very long conversation, How I committed. How old were you then, Brittany? Um, <laughs> I think at that time I was 27. When okay. I was sworn in to be Essex County Freeholder, I was 28. I wanted you to say that for a reason. <laughs> I want young people who are watching this, and we have a lot, a lot of young people who watch this, I want them to know that there is a future for them even now. Yes, there is. And um, I think that it's also important to know that what I was doing was just what was passionate to me as far as making sure that um, being a voice for the voiceless and talking about housing issues and things. I had absolutely no idea of what doors were about to open uh, just by making sure that I was being myself and being authentic in, in, in the cause. Um, so uh, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, also a great mentor of mine, she has been promoted to uh, Lieutenant Governor from Assembly. She used to be the Assemblywoman. And um, I was then uh, elected by the Essex um, and Passaic uh, Dems to take her seat and then ran an election and uh, was selected by the people via an election and then another one the following year. So I actually uh, ran for office for about three years straight um, just to secure, to, to be able to secure the seat um, that I have now. Um, and I'm so grateful to have, and that's what my journey is. I give all credit though to my parents because that's where it started from. My mother was an educator of the mentally and physically challenged and my father, um, he is a retired army 82nd airborne uh, sergeant first class. And um, now he's also a retired teacher uh, who used to teach in the Bronx at Morris Academy. So, you know, I come from service and it's my parents that groom me to make sure that, you know, we, we speak boldly, uh, we challenge authority when needed, and we work very hard to make sure that the people on the ground um, are actually getting the resources that, that they need. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, it's been it's been a wonderful ride for you, and I know that ride is just getting started. Um, I'm just hoping that the good Lord will keep me here a little bit longer so I can see how this story ends. Uh, now we're going to have our hair lady, the one who cares. She's going to tell us about her business. I love seeing all these giveaways. None other than Assemblywoman Angela McKnight. You have me smiling. <laughs> well, I started <laughs> always smile. That's why I love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I started in a corporate world and back in 2010, I decided to leave the corporate world and start um, become an entrepreneur. So I started a senior um, consulting business and then I noticed the void with the senior population. My mother and my grandmother were, um, I cared for them. They were in and out of rehab and nursing homes and I saw the void with the senior community. So I started in 2011, Angela Cares, where we help seniors, we bridge the gap between in the, um, children and seniors. We also help caregivers because I was a caregiver and I didn't have an outlet to go to. I didn't know who to call, who to talk to, to help me navigate through the social services for my grandmother and for my mother. So I started Angela Cares and in the trenches, uh, working day in and day out, the Hudson County Democratic Organization, as well as the mayor, Mayor Stephen um, and Philip from Jersey City, they approached me and they, they, they asked me to run for political office for the assembly. And when they asked me, I'm like, me? <laughs> I'm just minding my business, just you know, trying to help. But I had 24 hours to answer the question and I did my research, I did a Google to find out, well, what is an assembly person and what should that person do? <laughs> and within 24 hours, well, less than 24 hours, I got the call and they were like, they're waiting for the answer. So my speaking with my husband and some of my good friends and family members, they said, just go for it. Um, if you win, you can just ele elevate what you're doing in the community. And if you don't win, you can still do what you're doing. So I said, yes. 
I won overwhelmingly the first time. I was reelected the second time. And then the third time I got so many votes. So I enjoy doing this. I'm still running Angela Cares. With COVID, I have increased what we are doing to help people in the community. And I am loving the fact that I'm, I'm a legislator where I'm writing laws and I'm working for and with the people. Beautiful. Well, you have given away so much during this pandemic. I watch your Facebook. I mean, your Facebook is popping. And I look at what you and I said, you know what? I mean, I know that I'm supposed to be considered elderly. I'm not buying it yet. You know, I'm 70, but I'm not buying it yet. But I look at what you're doing for people in my age group. Assemblywoman, you're going to be blessed. You're doing the work of angels. And we thank you for that. We thank well, thank you, you and I thank you and I just want to say thanks to all the many volunteers because I couldn't do this without the volunteers, without yeah, my team yeah, warriors, my care partners, and supporters. So thank you because it takes a village. And thank you so much. Absolutely. So now the woman who thought she was late but she was right on time. How can you be late for a cyberspace uh, program anyhow? You can't be late because you're in and out anyway. Let's bring on the woman in the uniform. You know, let me tell you before you tell us about your journey. I look at I you and I have a, a common friend, Maggie Moran. Maggie right. and well, all of you on here, Maggie. These are and I know she's watching, but Maggie and I were on the phone with each other immediately when we saw you doing the video of how to make a mask. And we were both crying. We're like, this woman is working in the sheriff's office. She's an assembly woman. She has a lot on her plate and she's sitting there worried about people having masks and giving us, it was amazing. Tell us about your journey. So I'm, I'm going to start a little further back. So how I got started with all of this is actually my husband. Um, I, I, I've actually been married since I was 19 years old. And I just remember when we started dating and he was a district leader. And I remember how I got involved with seniors and children. He said, I want to introduce you to some of my friends. So oftentimes when you, you know, you're dating and you're meeting your mate's friends, your, his friends are younger individuals. So where he wound up taking me is to the senior buildings. Wow. And so um, after we went to the senior buildings, um, we spent maybe a couple of hours there and we was dating for maybe about a year and his friends were the seniors. And I just remember day after dating him uh, for this period of time that we spent hours at the senior buildings, bringing food to the seniors. And that was just like our daily routine, but that's how he, he was able to snatch me up, um, and food for the seniors. But uh, saying all that to say this, but moving forward, um, I ran for the school board twice, um, back in 2000, I believe five um, or six. I've also been a part of the democratic um, uh, committee, also ran for district leader, also been a vice chair of the democratic organization. And I've also was running a child care center for the last maybe 14, 15 years before I came became a sheriff officer. Um, and before running for assembly, um, you know, um, I took a break from school board and I had political mentors that have helped mentor me throughout this journey because I, God knows I couldn't do it myself. But I knew that before doing this, I've always was serving my community, out there feeding, uh, feeding the seniors, helping the children out in the community. And oftentimes people say, well, why don't you do for this? Well, why don't you do this in office? And I would always say, like, I don't need a title to um, do what I'm doing. Because to me, a title doesn't make you uh, elected official. It, it got to be from your heart. So it just all just worked out. I just had the community, I had community support and I had the political mentors that helped mentor me and my husband and my family support that helped mentor me along the way because God knows I wasn't able to do it myself. And it was oftentimes I would say, well, why am I going to do this? And why, why me? And by the grace of God and people that helped me along the way, I had to say, they, had, they said to me, well, why not you? Why don't you think you can do it? Why don't you think you qualified to do it? And I will always say, it's somebody else that somebody else can do it. But 
God, I thank God that he's he's been leading my journey along the way. And, you know, the people that's in my life, the political mentors, my family and everybody that's been supportive, supportive of me has been encouraging me along the way. And that's how I've been able to get here. And like uh, Janine, as you have four women on here tonight. We all have different stories, but we are all here and we have all made it this far. And, and it's not for ourselves it's to serve the people in the state. So. I'm and you serve you as all well. Thank and that's you. the thing that I love about it. You know, I, I want that optic of all of you together so I can see all of your faces together. Because um, when I think about the last legislative session, um, it was kind of fascinating to me because it was, we had a social justice agenda that I never thought I would see in the legislature all in one session. And it all happened in lame duck. You got a uh, driver's license for immigrants um, so that they could at least get driver's license to go to work. I didn't think we would get that done. You actually got people who are on parole and probation. They got their right to vote back. You got the law so that uh, discriminating against anybody based on ethnic hairstyles. I mean, it was just one, two, three. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And even with all of those games, did we get rid of racism? No. No, we, we have not. Racism. No. no. Even with the emancipation, we didn't get rid of racism. Even with the Civil Rights Act, we didn't get rid of racism. Even with the end of Jim Crow, we didn't get rid of racism. It's still here and it needs to be dealt with. And we're trying to deal with it through policies. You know, we also in New Jersey got the independent investigation passed for if someone loses their life Absolutely. during interaction with law enforcement, that was major. But we actually were up against a lot of odds with that. The PBA was publicly out, um, not in support of it. The attorney general, unfortunately at the time was not either. And we had to do a grassroots movement and get the governor to sign the bill, which I'm very grateful that he is the most progressive governor in the country, I believe. And he, he did indeed end up signing that bill into law. But, but here's the bottom line, even through all of that, that same year that we did that bill, New Jersey Advanced Media had come out with the force report that actually showed where um, the issues of excessive use of force were happening in New Jersey. And some, some, some places and some towns, even in Essex County were on that list, such as South Orange. And it's caused the town to take a hard look at what it really means to be a police uh, department at, and also a part of the community. So even though we didn't get rid of racism and we may not even do it in our lifetime, let's look at what we have been able to accomplish over the last week. It's hard to believe that it's only been eight days since George Floyd was executed. And I was looking before I came on this show, looking at the tens of thousands of protesters who are still going strong, eight days going strong all over this country now, all over the world. Mm -hmm. How do you ladies feel when you see people getting down on one knee now, when you see all of these folks now admitting that there have been problems that have existed for many, many years. Tell me, how do you feel about it? Verlina, I'd like to hear from you on that. You know, I think about the partnerships that you need in our community. So for me, it, it, it lets me know that we have great partners, but it also still reveals those that you know, don't understand why all Black lives matter. You know, I've, I continue to hear all lives matter. And I'm like, wait, you're, you're, you're missing the, the point here. You're missing the discrimination here. You're missing the, the racism, the sexism, the gender discrimination. Like you're missing all of that when you say that. So, you know, I, I listen, I watch, I hear, our youth are doing an amazing job at speaking out and making sure that they are vocal and that we hear some of the changes that we, we want. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's a 50-50, you know, you get some that are listening and then you got some that 
aren't there, but it definitely strengthens the relationship that we have in the community. And it's definitely not over, but it's a good foundation for us to really continue the conversation and continue creating policies and new legislation that will impact everybody in the state of New Jersey. One of the other things that when we look at it, um, and a lot of people don't like to talk about the other spectrum of it. Here in Trenton, we're looking at a situation, 15 homicides, oh. and it's black on black crime. Um, tell me, Angela, tell me how you feel about that. I mean, what should the conversation be on that issue? Because it's a problem. Well, what I want to first say is, um, I want us to remove saying black on black crime because we don't hear white on white crime, mm -hmm. Asian on Asian crime, right? It's, it's just crime. Mm -hmm. it's, it's disheartening for any person to kill another person. That's I'm, happy, I'm happy that I see our youth out here and they're fighting. They're fighting for a purpose. They're fighting for cause. But we as elders, we need to be behind them because, because some of them don't know where to turn. Some of them just need guidance. Just here in Jersey City, a group of amazing activists, they put two gang members together for a truth. And when wow. I saw that, I was like, wow, this is what we need. We need to have, we need to bring them together in a, in a peaceful situation, talk to them and let them air out their differences. Because no matter where you live, there are always going to be neighbor, you know, neighbor having a problem with another neighbor. But I first want everybody to no longer say black on black crime. Mm -hmm. A crime is just a crime. That's and a yesterday we had Thank you. Yesterday yeah. we had um, a peaceful um, protest by a group of um, um, activists. The day before that, we had another um, peaceful protest by another group of activists. And when I see the cops kneeling, I called Brittany yesterday, because we tend mm -hmm. to call each other, all of us. I called Brittany yesterday and we both cried on the phone because I thought of Colin Kaepernick when he mm -hmm. kneeled. And he was ridiculed, but now others are kneeling and nothing is being said in a derogatory way. And I cried with Brittany and I said, Brittany, it's amazing that, you know, black people, and I'm here to say, we stand for so much. We are in the trenches. We are resilient back from 400 plus years ago. So we can do this, but I don't want us to stop with you know, with this advocacy, I want us to, you know, dismantle racism, but also crime on, on a holistic approach, especially in our neighborhoods. Now, one of the things, and don't don't take her away to our producer, I want her to stay right up here, because there there is um, a, a major point that has been made here. One of the things that I have said, and I said it as recently as probably two hours before the show came on, uh, to someone we most of us know and love, Junius Williams. He'll be coming on the show. I think he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And I said, you know, young people are going to show us how to do this. Now, you all are, who are on here right now, you're not the millennials, the young, young, young people, but you're certainly a heck of a lot younger than I am. And when you said, well, we shouldn't say black on black crime. A light bulb went off with me. And I'm now that's something people in my age group say all the time. You're absolutely right, we shouldn't say that. And I think it's going to be the younger generation, your generation, those who are younger than you, those who are still in high school, even, you all are going to change this landscape because some of us are stuck in the mud. Now we're trainable. I mean, yeah, you can teach, teach an old dog new tricks. We're trainable. But the thing I love about you guys, because we had, we had a woman on last week who actually made a comment. We were on with the uh, Congresswoman. 
and that speaking truth to power, that's going to be part of what's going to change the landscape. So I thank you for that. Thank you. And I'm not going to say that anymore. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to say that anymore. Shanique, tell me you're in law enforcement and you see this every single day, some portion of it. How has what's going on, how has it affected you? Well, um, so being in law enforcement as a, as a mother, um, black mother of three African-American boys, and then also being in law enforcement. And, you know, the, the thing is you always trying to protect the blue line, but besides trying to protect the blue line, my, 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 my thing has always been, I have to protect my boys before I, before I'm trying to protect the blue, blue line. My, my boys are African-American boys, but at the same time, um, I just just experiencing this and and under and and seeing how what's taking place and I just I don't want it to be portrayed that you know this is every it's not good or good cop or bad cop this is all officers behavior it's not the, the behavior of all officers it's not even a it's not even their behavior. I just think it's their mindset. It's it's a learned behavior that they grew up with. It's racism that's in their heart. It's racism that's in their mind. It's not even that I just look at it, it's not that badge that they're wearing, it's not that uniform that they're wearing, it's the hate that they have in their heart. And it's just I just don't want people to look at all officers with the, just determining like, oh this is who they are, they, who they are. And it's, that's not everyone, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're Asian, what, whatever color these officers are, every officer behavior is not like that. But at the same time, I have seen some of the most racist officers. With me being an officer, there's no reason I should be driving down the street sometime, in another town as an officer and sometimes afraid if I'm gonna get pulled over, having an ID and all, but afraid if I'm going to get stopped and be handled the wrong way. But at the same time, it's just I'm, I, sometimes I'm just stuck between that rock and that hard place because I'm on both sides of the stick and trying to understand both sides. But I, I don't understand. I would never understand or justify racism. I would never justify it because it. when I was watching a video, I kept I was counting down like, when is he going to take his knee off his neck? He has to take it off now. And with a straight face, I just couldn't understand why he kept continuing just to leave his knee on the neck. So it's it's just a hard place for me. The one thing that you have raised, and I'm glad that you pointed it out, as uh, many of you know, I represent uh, the Fraternal Order of Police uh, relative to communications. I've represented them now for almost a decade. And there are times that I would look in the mirror and say to myself, Janine, really? Really, and I can honestly say, in the state of New Jersey, I have never been asked to write a press release that goes against the grain of what I believe in. Uh, but when I got the call from the president um, a few days ago, and he said to me, "Well, he said um, I'm calling you because I want uh, I want a statement put out as it relates to George Floyd." And I remember taking the phone and turning it back and looking at it like, okay, Janine, uh, this is when truth goes to power because I didn't know what statement he wanted me to write. And he said, I want to denounce the behavior. I want to denounce what that officer did. Right. And I sat down before I wrote the statement and I just stared at my um, laptop, the screen for a while. And I said, how far we have come. And Shanique, it goes basically to the heart of what you were saying. All police officers are not bad. All you, you can't have the majority of the police officers bad. We really wouldn't be able to live in this country if, if that were the case. It's just a small few who some of them maybe they should have selected another profession. Some are just stressed out. Some are scared. Some of the behavior that happens because they're scared. But I'm glad that today 
that the um, attorney general in Minnesota came forth and made the decision that maybe this is a real turning point across this nation. So people will sit up straight and pay attention because when I see the wall of how many men and women have lost their lives, gone forever, it's taken too long to get to this point. Right, totally yes. agree. So we're gonna kick over to another topic. We're still living in the COVID-19 era. Um, and I know you all have had several um, Zoom meetings. I've watched them on Facebook where you talk about the unemployment, you're talking about the health disparities. Uh, what's going, with, uh, going on with unemployment in this state right now? Well, I don't know if take that as we know. Yeah, unemployment, as you know, um, is at an all time high. Um, besides the antiquated system that we've had, um, you know, the Department of Labor is doing the best that it can. Um, but it's frustrating when you have bills due. You know, you got rent, you got you got power, you got electricity, you got food that you have to provide for your family. Um, just being at home all day with your family, it costs you more money, you know. It does. Um, we Water have, bill is higher, electricity yes. is higher, food, everything is your higher. Is so, in. <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, you, you look to try to get answers to the system and you know you got to call in according to your last name um you know your your application gets rejected and you know okay i'll do another one that's not good and you know we're in a, a period of time now where we talk about um you know uh, uh, uh your identity theft so mm -hmm. there's some problems there and although these things are supposed to be proactive, it still doesn't help people get money in their pockets. Exactly. And so it's very, very frustrating. Um, you know, and even in our, our communities, you know, our unemployment rates are already high. They're doubled and tripled in some places. And so, you know, we're looking at ways to, you know, re-employ folks and redirect them and try to see if they can go back to work. But there's no summer camp. There's no school. So sometimes that's not even an option. And so, you know, you're trying to call everybody you can to say, you know, I, I need to lean on the field. I need to lean on you to see what can you do? How can you help me? And people are desperate right now. So, you know, we, we, we're trying to do the best we can. I know my office is in uh, triple digits of, of hundreds of calls. And I'm sure all of our offices are too. And, um, you know, we, we hear from the community. We talked about the upgrades and bringing people back in from retirement. Um, and still, that's not enough. But we're, they're doing the best they can. And, you know, we're trying to refer people to different resources and to make sure that they have food and make sure they have shelter. And so, you know, to all the social service agencies, the nonprofits, the food banks, you are all doing God's work. And we just thank you for it in the interim and try it before so that people can get their income that they earned. So let's be clear about that. This is, they worked for it, they earned it. And now this is the time that they're supposed to get it. So, you know, we just have to continue on making sure we provide for the residents in other ways. But it's extremely difficult to say that when you don't have enough money to go to the grocery store to feed your family. Yeah, and, and I want to add, my office and just as well as everyone else office here we are getting inquiries from the community from our constituents and i just got a report uh, another report today from my um, chief of staff mm -hmm. and there's hope because the number of inquiries that are coming into my office are, are starting to diminish so that means the system they are beginning to answer those inquiries. We, I, I'm telling you all, we understand what's going on. My office is also sending people over to my nonprofit to get food on Fridays. So just keep continuing to reach out to your legislative office because we are there to help the unemployment office so that you can get your money. You deserve your money and we will do all we can to make sure that you get, like Verlina just said, you get what you already put out. You're muted. 
I got a phone call in the middle of it. I heard everything you said, but it was also a FaceTime. So that was kind of cute. Um, well, I, I'm glad that the inquiries are de decreasing uh, because I'm getting a lot of phone calls from folks. Yeah. And um, it, it's pretty dire out there. Now, what yes. about are we still at a point where people cannot be evicted from their we are still at a point where people cannot be evicted uh, out of their apartment. That's actually under an executive order. And as long as the state of emergency is in effect, um, no one can be evicted and no foreclosure can go forth. Um, and McKnight was also, uh, and we were also on that bill too, with uh, making sure that the foreclosures um, did not occur during COVID. Um, but uh, the governor has done excellent things around rental assistance. They just launched a $100 million fund that came from uh, the CARES Act to help out with rental assistance. And um, he also passed a piece of legislation. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, he also did an executive order to make sure that uh, people could use their security deposit to count toward a month of rent. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, housing advocates myself and 150 other organizations, including these ladies on the phone, who I'm so humbled to serve with, uh, have been on the front lines in regard to this housing uh, issue and also for both renters and homeowners. Um, we have a bill currently that uh, Speaker Coughlin is uh, seriously considering to put up and we are asking for it to be to be heard and listed for a full vote that would make sure that there is a, a rent pause to occur for those who um, for those who are renting, but that there also be a uniform mortgage forbearance for those who are owners um, so that they can actually apply for forbearance. And in both scenarios, and if you're a mortgage owner, or if you are a, um, a renter, that your credit would not be impacted, just making sure that you would not have any uh, added fees and ultimately prevent homelessness. Uh, New Jersey is unfortunately still leading the country in foreclosures. Uh, and in leading, leading, speaking of also racism and systematic racism, uh, leading the state in foreclosures are our urban areas. So um, we have to make sure that we protect both homeowners and also renters. And um, I'm hoping that that bill pass. We've worked extremely hard on it. Shout out to the Housing and Community Development Network, Ironbound Community Corporation, Fair Share Housing, New Jersey Citizen Action. I'm just naming four of 150 uh, advocates who have lent their voice and actually helped and assisted. We've gone line by line to write the best piece of legislation to help all segments of the population as it relates to housing. Beautiful. I want to, and I can't believe when you're having fun, the time just flies. And so we're almost to the end of the show, but I do not want us to leave before we talk about a very, 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 very important day. All that's going on, it all leads to one place. You got to vote. That's right. You got to vote. Tell us about the new terms right. of our primary election on July 7th because it's going to be very different. And when people start getting the uh, ballots in the mail, it's going to look pretty complicated. It is. And I, I think we have to be really strong about it and vocal. You know, part of uh, after, you know, we march, we organize, we plan, we demonstrate, and then we repeat again. Part of that planning and execution is definitely in the voting process. If we're talking about, you know, um, uh, increasing the voter turnout by applicate by vote by mail. You know, we're, we're also talking about protecting our congressional districts. Um, if you want to talk about systematic racism, let the Jedi mind trick be that you don't fill out that vote by mail. Um, I, was, I, would, I would say don't do it. Fill out the vote by mail. Um, this makes it even easier. And, and Janine, I just have to give a plug for the census as well. We're all home right now. Again, it's about counting the population so that we could get funding for our communities that we desperately right. need. We leave billions of dollars on the table. And it's not like the pot is dwind, goes less if we don't fill it out. It's just other places get it. And when we talk about we need new schools, we need um, new hospitals, we need different facilities, we need computers and technology. Um, we're talking about um, closing the digital divide. 
all of these things are about the census and it's about voting. And so you just have to, whatever your, your plight is, if you're you know, an activist for gun violence, if you're an activist for fighting for women's um, uh, health issues, if you're an environmental justice uh, advocate, whatever it may be, let that be your reason to say, I'm going to fill out my census and I'm going to fill out my vote by mail ballot. You don't need an excuse. You can do it right now. And so the vote by mails are going to be coming out. I just implore everyone to do it. Call your friends, go through your Rolodex, just like you were planning a party and make sure they get their vote by mail and that they return it. It's extremely important. If you want to say it, our lives are on the line right now. Mm -hmm. I don't survive another four years under this type of administration. But we also have to send our congressional people and our senators back to the White House so that we can have equal balance in both houses. So when we talk about systematic, it all goes together. The vote is one thing, the census is another, but participation at the grassroots le level makes us a mighty force to fight together. So let's do that. Let's, let's march, organize, plan, demonstrate, repeat. And vote, 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 vote. Exactly. Can I add something? Please do. Can I? And when they're filling out that mail-in ballot, one of the most important things, and uh, one of the errors from the last election, uh, school board election, is making sure they fill out that ballot correctly because you can right. make one mistake and that uh, that ballot would be possibly tossed out. So when it comes to the signature or maybe not filling out the uh, em uh, the envelope the right way, the right way your vote possibly won't count. So it's so important that it's filled out correctly. You know, you can make all efforts to send your ballot in, but if it's not filled out correctly or if your signature is possibly not matching up um, to your driver's license uh, uh, signature, it's possibly, it's a possibility that your um, ballot will be thrown out. So you just want to make sure that it's filled out correctly. If you don't know how to fill it out, reach out to someone, just like Berlina said, to just make sure that um, you're doing everything uh, the right way, because just like we, uh, they said, systemic racism mm -hmm. will continue to happen in our uh, country and in our state. And we can protest and do all that we can and, 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 and trying to do. But if we don't get this president out of here, guess what? We will continue to experience it. Keep it real. You have something to say? Go for it, Angela. Yes. I want to go back to the to COVID for the business community. On June the 9th, June 9th at 9 a.m., the New Jersey Economic Development Authority will open up for small businesses um, and medium-sized businesses, you can apply for a grant. So that is phase two. They have received an additional $5 million. So please go June 9th, log on to the website and apply 9 a.m. So I suggest you start logging on at 8.45 so that once nine o'clock comes in the morning, you apply for, for some funds. And this please is a first come first serve basis. And this is for small businesses in the state of New Jersey. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And and let me just close by saying this. We have 120 legislators in the state of New Jersey. And for our viewers out there, and we've had some pretty great viewers tonight, I want you to know this is representative of what we have working for us every day. And no one can disagree with me tonight. Looking at the four of you, we are in very, very very good hands. I thank you so much coming on the show tonight. You have kicked thank off you. real thank talk you. that will be happening every Wednesday at seven. And I'm telling you, it has been a real joy for this lady right here. Thank you, Larulis Cafe. I love each of you. Thank you. We love you, Janine. We you are the you. absolute best. Thank you. Well, for we got to give for I want you to hold that thought. Wait a minute. Don't go anywhere. Hold on. <laughs> I want you to do something. Oh, that was my award from Brittany. Oh, I love you. Yeah. I love you. Gotta do this every song. single day. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank All you. right. I love you guys. You. All right, Trailblazer. Yes. Thank you Take so care. much. Have a good night. You too. Thank you.